What are we going to say? Let me pray for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, again, we just come to another beginning, uh, Lord, of another uh, group of Sunday school lessons. Lord, we thank you for bringing us through the last quarter. Lord, I thank you for Dr. Harvey, Lord, and the writings and the writers from the Sunday School Publishing Board, Lord, that, Lord, this month after month or year after year, they keep uh, publishing, Lord, just this godly content. Lord, I just thank you for their sound doctrine. Lord, I just uh, praise you, Lord, for that. Lord, I ask that you just open our eyes and ears so we can see and hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Saints, we begin a new quarter today, lesson one, September 4th, 2022, unit one, God's, God calls Abraham's family unbroken promises. And the devotional reading is Hebrews 11, 8 through 19. And the background scriptures, Genesis 12, 1 through 7, 15, 1 through 7, print passes, Genesis 12, 1 through 5, 7, and then 15, 1 through 7. And the key verse, the Lord appeared unto Abraham, and said unto your seed will I give the land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, who appeared to him in the lesson aims today. As a result of experiences less, you should trace the promises that God made to Abram, Abraham and their fulfillment. Appreciate the frustration that comes with having to wait a long time for an expected good thing to happen. And I wanna pause right there because we don't have a review today because this is our first lesson. And again, uh, especially for those of you on YouTube, uh, I'm going to just make these lessons more concise and, and more com compact for reasons that I explained to you anyway in uh, the last video, which was just looking at the metrics. Uh, most of you go you know, 18, 20 minutes, and after that, you're gone. And so I want to use my time well, and I, uh, because I, you know, I pastor in a congregation, have a street ministry, uh, I'm a, a small business owner, uh, and those other things. So I want to use all of our times well. But if I thought to, if, if I could prove that you'd hang around for an hour, I'd, I'd teach for an hour. But I just want us uh, both to uh, use our times well and use the time the Lord has given us well. And when we talk about uh, the waiting for a long time for a good thing to come, we remember Abraham. Um, he waited years and years uh, just for that promise. Uh, for the promised son to be fulfilled. And you remember even before that, that Abraham and Sarah tried, well, Sarah tried to step in, Abraham agreed, so they were both involved. you always trying to, you know, brothers always trying to blame stuff on Eve first. Adam had to go along. And then Sarah, Abraham had to go along. Y'all need to stop trying to blame sisters for all this stuff. Even, even uh, Ahab, you know, Jezebel, Ahab had to go along. Y'all need to stop trying to blame our sisters for all of that one. Y'all be going along with it too. So I said that to point out is that Sarah and Abraham, came, um, Sarah and Abraham, uh, Sarah gave Abraham her handmaid, which was Hagar the Egyptian, and along came Ishmael. But Ishmael was the son of the flesh; he was not a son of the promise. And along came Isaac. Isaac was the son of the promise because it came through Sarah and not as Ishmael had through her handmaid. But the issue became that they became impatient because they were waiting a long time, and they had to help God along in their minds. So that becomes important because none of us were there when that occurred. Nobody was even alive, obviously, when that occurred. But isn't it interesting that the decisions of Sarah and Abraham to bring forth Ishmael into the world, then the son of the promise came along, Isaac, for which the Jews came through, the Hebrews and, and well, the promise, to say the promise came through. Isn't that interesting because Today, we still see the fallout from their decision to try to help God through Hagar the Egyptian. You always hear, most of you say that you hear about the war between Arabs and Jews over there. You always see something breaking out in the Middle East between Arab and Jews, right? That goes all the way back to Ishmael and Ishmael, Isaac, Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham. They've been warring. Uh, they've been warring since that time. So the, the issue becomes if we don't wait on God, there are consequences for us trying to rush God along or helping God that will extend, saying, far beyond even your own lifetime. Now, I told you before that that is an area where I am always challenged is patience. So I don't want to sit in front of you as a hypocrite. Just to tell you, remember, we, we talked about this, but the Lord is really helping. I'm going to share something with you. Uh, the Holy Spirit reminds me, I'm going to share something with you uh, that, that my teacher just told me 
you know, my teachers just told me, two of them just told me a few weeks ago, and it really helped me along. So I'm here because I've made a lot of progress in the area of patience. But remember I, I said to you, I will preach against uh, things like church leaders having girlfriends and, 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 and just uh, the adultery and the whoring around, and that's the biblical word, that word whoring is in the Bible. So whoring around on the watch, I'm going to preach against it all day long because that ain't something that I'm, I'm going to do. I'm just, you can't never say what you want to do. You know how people say, you should never say, that's something I'm not going to do. I don't care who come up in my face. He better come up in my face. You better get saved and you better repent. I'm not going out like that. I don't struggle with that so I can preach against that. And I also shared with you all jealousy. I don't struggle with that. I'll pre I, I never struggled with jealousy because I've all, even when I was in the world, I just believe in who God made me to be. So I don't struggle with jealousy. So I preach against that. One of those areas, however, where I'm extremely challenged, but I'm growing. And that's the only reason I'm sitting in front of you now. If I hadn't, if I hadn't taken the bounds I had in the last uh, two years, th uh, three years anyway, uh, I, I wouldn't be sitting. I would just call this off and see if, uh, see if somebody else could teach it, or I would just wait until the winter quarter to start back up. But I am here today because I'm telling you, I've made huge leaps in the area of patience, right? So that's why I'm here today. So I'm saying that to point out that it is, and speaking from somebody that struggles with that, appreciate the frustration of having to wait. That's defined as impatience. I'm speaking to you authoritatively as somebody who struggled mightily with that in the past, right? Still have my struggles from time to time now being impatient and these sorts of things. But at the same time, we have to believe and know that God is who he says he is and he's going to do what he says he can do. So that is going to require us waiting on him. And before I move forward, let me share this with you. I've always, you know, over the years, I've had websites and I made money online website with my own websites, own informational products. But just now in the last year, have I gotten to a place where I'm able to masterfully go out and perfect that process with uh, sustaining the ministry online, uh, providing for my family, like online, just working through that. And it's interesting because I was so impatient about it when I was younger, but now that I'm older, I realize that my, my, my small business online is growing, but it's going to be some years before it super duper takes off. I wouldn't have been able to sit here and tell you I was going to wait even five years ago, right? But again, those things that God has for us, they may happen towards the end of our life, but we want them early because in our minds, we want to enjoy it, but we have to wait on God. And surely Sarah and Abraham wanted a child earlier in their life, but God said, no, there's going to be a time that that happens because the thing is, even if Sarah was even 20 years younger, whatever it was, it's possible that they could have taken credit for the birth. But when you get to a certain age as a woman, you can't, 90, whatever that was, you ain't going to be able to take credit for that birth. But we have to be patient and wait on God, especially for those of you watching these Sunday school lessons. Uh, I see the demographics, too, of the wolves who are watching, and most of them are, like, older, like me. And I want to tell you that there's some things that, that God is only going to be able to do, like in the case of Abraham and Sarah, in the, at the end of your life that he couldn't accomplish in the beginning because in the beginning of your life or when you was younger, you would have been able to say it was because of my work or with a woman because I was fertilized and the baby had an age anyway. So I had, you know, or whatever that is by your hand or the work, your company, that house, whatever that is, thing that you wanted God to bless you with or you asked God to bless you with, there's some things that he's only going to do later in your life because you, he's going to know that only you that only he you're going to know that only he could have done it and you're going to give him credit for doing it because with me before i move on here what's going what's building right now is something that god had to give me the gift in order i developed the talent to put up the sites to create the sales funnels write the articles all things i have to do online marketing search engine information search engine management uh, marketing, uh, web development. I had to develop my skills and all that. And even God gave me the strength to do that. But what he gave me to provide to the world could only have come from him and only could have come right now. Glory. Hallelujah. And develop strategies to wait patiently on God. 
Amen. And we're going to go straight to the analysis. Now, let's do the introduction. Most people have experienced the pain of a broken promise, although most broken promises are not intentional. Humanity's fallen condition makes them an unfortunate part of life. Uh, a saint to most high God. And when, when we talk about waiting on God, and when we even talk about unbroken, the title of the lesson, Unbroken Promises, God's not going to break his promises. You know, one of the things, and I've done that myself with my kids, and it wasn't intentional, but it still happened, so it was still sin, right? And I had to repent of it because my um, um, my father used to tell me all the time, you know, left us in foster care and this type of thing, and then my mama left all this other stuff. We grew up foster care. But we were our mother. Uh, he said, oh, son, I'm going to come get you. We're going to come pick you up. I'm going to take you to the Cali Congress, which is a fair here, yearly in Waterloo, Iowa. And, man, I used to be looking out the window waiting on him, and you're, he just never showed up. Son, I'm going to give you some money. He never showed up. One time he showed up and gave me a dollar food stamp. <laughs> I remember them brown food stamps. He gave me a dollar food stamp, but he just he broke promises to me so much that at a point I just, you know, just kind of wrote him off because I knew he wasn't going to do anything. And even as a father, uh, my son uh, told me one time, I said, I'm going to send you, you know, a Bible. And I was like, yeah, boy, I'm, you know, I'm going to send you. Gone, slipped my mind. I had to repent. I told him I was, didn't. I had to repent because tension not, it's still a lie. So I forgot. And so I'm not trying to make excuses. It was a lie. That's what it was. I repented. He writes a few, he, he, he gets a hold of me and he writes a short note to me. And this is a scripture my, my son quoted. He said, to him to know to do right and do it if not to them that is sin. And I said that, <laughs> ouch, ouch. My flesh was hostile with my boy, but my soul was happy. But it was a broken promise to him. And so I'm, I'm not trying to bust my father. And I'm saying that as this says, it's an unfortunate part of life because something always slips on mind. It isn't intentional, but it doesn't matter. What matters is the outcome. The effects of broken promises are very broken promises can result in compromised relationships, damaged reputation, delay of necessary tasks, schedule disruption, emotional distress, and disappointment. Unfortunately, the natural ability to control the circumstances and the events of life sometimes makes it impossible for any individual to keep even the simplest promise. Therefore, those who make a promise and fail to follow through must always recognize the considerable impact it has on others. It just has that impact on others. How then should Christians deal with their own broken promises? Here are four steps. Admit failure, acknowledge the impact, apologize for the consequences, and assist in resolving the issue. And, and again, repentance is necessary because something's always going to slip your mind. And even the word of God tells us, saints, it is better to not vow a vow than vow a vow and don't follow through with it, right? So the announcement of the biblical text chosen and called to let go, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get thee out of your country and from your kindred to a land that I will show you, and I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curses you, and I will bless them, and, I, and through you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's what it says there. And the description says redemption's history begins with God taking the initiative by calling Abraham. The call, Genesis 15, 7, Nehemiah 9, 7, Abraham was commanded to let go of three sources of personal security, his country, his relatives, and his father's house. And, and saints, again, it all begins there by letting go, realizing a promise that God made to you is going to begin by letting go unbroken promises, if you will. Right. Because a lot of times we don't we we even believe some of us that God broke promise that we ain't going to say it. But we just think but we get frustrated because we believe God has broken a promise and not do what he says he's going to do just because he didn't do what we said. Well, when we think that he should do it. Right. But letting go and realizing God's fulfillment of his promises means you got to let go of broken promises in your past and that disappointment. Because again, when I realize, you know, I can point a finger at my father if I want to, and y'all know I ain't one to soften the impact, but I get to point a finger right at me because I failed too. I have failed in that area as well. And the truth is, if I would have held on to the promises this earthly father, my physical father made to me and broke them, I would have a hard time believing God for his promises today. Oh, you want me to, I couldn't even trust the man that I can't see, can't see. You want me to trust one I don't? That's a lot of problem. 
as well, just speaking to brothers that don't come to church. That's a lot of problem with men that don't, black men especially, that don't attend church. Because so many of them have been let down by their own earthly fathers. I mean, today, you figure since 1971, that uh, homeless, that fatherless, uh, that, that fatherless home thing has increased from like, in 19, was it 1959, 1960, there was 72, 73% of black homes had a father. Now, 73, 74% don't have black fathers in the home. And that trust between their earthly father, that those broken promises from their earthly fathers was made, and now you expect me to listen to someone that I can't see, especially when I know that there are certain men that speak on his behalf that are just that that are just as as uh, that, that are just as low down as the man who left me and said he was my father. Oh, come on, y'all! So, sisters, I really want to say this to you, and then I'm gonna talk to brothers, and I know I got to move on here. Is a lot of that thing you dealing with? About brother not coming to church, you know your husband better than I do, I'm sure. And he's sitting there week after week, right? You really need to get down and ask him the hard questions, no matter how long you have been married. Let me tell you something I didn't even realize. And uh, my, uh, my my teachers pointed it out to me. We were talking about, they were, they were, they were you know, teaching me on um, being nurturing. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm hardcore. I'm not a touchy type of feely guy. And that's why I told you uh, the real pastors that, that God sends. I'm talking about the real ones. I'm not talking about hirelings. I'm not talking about hustlers and pimps. I'm talking about like the, 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 four, the three and ten God really sends, which we know as those who remain. Some of us call them the remnant. I'm talking about the three and ten. The three and ten, God sprinkles a little extra tenderizer on them brothers' hearts. And they're just, they're just so nurturing. And man, they're, you know, I need this cry quick. I, I admire them, man. They just, they, they can hold hands and I admire that. I'm kind of the opposite of that. I'm kind of the guy that's going to swing the sword, make you bleed and tell you to suck it up. But they said something to me. These, teacher, these two teachers, they said something to me. They was like, just because you are who you are doesn't exempt you from de demonstrating the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience. Y'all know what they are. So what does that got to do with anything? What that has to do with this, saints, is, uh, sisters, you have to ask those deep, hard questions. Because I didn't realize I was still maybe dealing with some things lately of abandonment myself. And that's kind of my resistant thing to nurture. Now, these, this sister and brother brought me the word. They didn't bring me under that philosophical, psychological nonsense. I'm not listening to anybody that comes to me with their, their, their not, especially church leaders come to me with your nonsense. You're looking on top of your glasses trying to sound wise, but you will not give me the word of God. I don't trust that. I don't trust you. They came, and I said to the point out, they came with the word of God. So sisters, when you go, go with the word of God and try to figure out what's really going on. You're going to see that what I'm telling you will make sense. And then some of you brothers as well, a lot of that stuff you're dealing with, with our sisters and their brokenness and a lot of their hostility still, they're in relationships, they're in marriages, but they're still struggling with some baggage from the past. You're dealing with broken promises with them as well. Fathers have left them, mothers have dogged them, and especially sisters that have kids by somebody else. And then you coming into the place and you stepping in and wondering what's going on with them and what's going on with her. They suffered unbroken promises or they suffered broken, sorry, broken promises as well. So when I think about our men that are at home dealing with their broken promises and then our sisters are dealing with broken promises. Man, you got a couple of broken people in the place that's both broken, speaking brokenness into the marriage and into the home and into the church, which is equal in more brokenness. Hey, man, I didn't mean to get to preaching up there, but, but you, you see where I'm going. What do you think? Why is an intimate relationship with God a requirement for responding to his neat call in our lives? Again, when we talk about intimate, and, and again, when we talk about intimate, we are talking about like the disciple that laid his head on Jesus' bosom. I mean, that, that just intimate relationship between a father and daughter, father and uh, a son, whatever that is, that is literally what it should mean. Now, here's here's what I will 
say to you is because we're talking about broken promises. We need to deal with this as a community. We, we, we have to deal with this, right? Jesus told his disciples, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. That's what Jesus told his disciples. So us that are dealing with broken promises from people that have left us and have abandoned us, we have to realize that the problem becomes is that we are expecting more disappointment and we won't even admit that we believe God has disappointed us as well because he hasn't answered certain prayers. Oh, come on, man. Get real up in here. Get real up in here. Why well, I got to do this? We believe Jeremiah accused God of lying to him. In Jeremiah chapter 20, Behold, thou, thou art God, but you've deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I have prevailed. Right off the top of my spirit. And since he said God lied to him, and then he gets it together, and most of y'all know that scripture, when Jeremiah got himself together after making that statement, he said, I said I wasn't going to make mention him, preach anymore, or speak in his name, but his word was as in my heart, and as a burning fire shut up in my bones. That statement was the ending of Jeremiah accusing God at first of lying to him. Did you know that? No, you didn't know that. So again, even prophets in the Bible believed God because things didn't turn out the way they think he should, that God had lied to them. What do you, the intimate relationship is necessary for the unique calling because only when, as they said to me, you know, as my teacher said to me, when he was talking about the fruits of the spirit, the fruits of the spirit come when that intimacy grows in God. Committing to the call, Genesis 12, 4 through 5, and then 7. And just 4, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and was the seven, and he was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the substance that they gathered, and the souls that had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and in the land of Canaan they came. Now verse 7, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thee will I give this land, and you shall build an altar to the Lord who appeared there. And the description says, After the death of Abraham's father, Terah, the Lord appeared to Abraham, calling him to depart from his country into another land. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, encapsulated in the simple statement is a declaration of commitment to the unquestioned obedience and faith in God's word. When God spoke, Abraham believed and committed to obeying him. D did you notice, and let's just say Genesis chapter 12. Did you notice in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham just start walking. Abraham believed God, the Bible says, and it was counted to him for what? Righteousness. He believed God. He start walking, finally got to see the land of Canaan. He didn't go in with his children, uh, which came with 400 some, whatever that number was years later out of Egypt, but he got to see it. But here was the other thing. He also got to experience the promise of a son. So God delivered on the promise of a land and delivered on promises of a descendant. And you know, God is so awesome that he's not going to break a promise. Why would he need to? Why would God possibly need to break a promise to you? And what do you think? What specific evidence proves that Abraham's kind of commitment is a rare commodity within today's church? Because in today's church, we have things called strategic plans where we have to accomplish goal one, two, and three we put before we jump out to four. Well, that's not what Abraham did. Brother church leaders and um, brother and sister auxiliary leaders and saints of God. Abraham got out and he jumped to step four and didn't even worry about one and two. He didn't say, God, I need to uh, have a GPS to know where I'm going. God said, start walking to a land I will show you. He didn't say, here's a land walking. He said to a land I will show you. What you don't understand and what I even had a hard time grasping years ago was in order for you to see the actual promises of God, you have to start walking, but you want to see the promise and then start walking. You want the GPS and then you want to walk because in, deep inside your heart, you wonder if God is going to show up in the situation. But I'm telling you, we talked about broker's promises for sisters and brothers. We talked about childhood. We talked about those things. But you got to realize with God, you need to just get out and you need to start walking. Genesis 15, 1 through 7. After these things, the word of the Lord came into Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house 
is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he shall come forth out of your own bowels. And he brought him forth abroad, and look now toward the heaven, and tell the stars, if you are able to number them, and say unto them, So shall your seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And this, or counted him for righteousness. This is, uh, again, uh, uh, stated in the in, in the New Testament as well. And he said to him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And Abraham's response to God's second call initiated his journey into Canaan in a series of faith tests. I just told you, the journey through Canaan revealed that the fulfillment of God's promise is not always immediate and struggle-free. And most often, it is never immediate and struggle-free. It isn't that you have to struggle to get it because you don't. What you have to struggle for is to keep your faith. It's a faith struggle. Because if you, if you think about it, you never have to struggle to try to get it. Because if I believe that he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, and the same God that wrote the beginning um, in uh, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, as well as the book of Genesis, and wrote the ending in Revelation, I must also believe that whatever that thing is, it's already done. If God can write the end, whatever that thing is, is already done. It has to be. How can you produce prophetic portions of scripture if those things in Revelation aren't already done? Whatever that thing is, it's already done. So you just have to struggle to hold on to God. You don't have to struggle to get it because it's already done. It's God's place to give it to you, for you to receive it. It is your faith. That's going to make that thing manifest. Here's how I know that. Because do you know when a prayer is answered? A prayer is answered when God's will meets your request. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? How can believers remain faithful while waiting on God to fulfill delayed promises? What do we learn from Abraham's struggle? Saints of the Most High God, as we dig into this series, and I'm, I'm shortening it up. Be blessed that God can deliver. And don't forget, you need to, sisters, dig into what's going on with your husband, fiance, and brothers dig into and realize that a lot of our sisters, even though they ain't got kids coming to marriage, a lot of them are broken as well. Speaking brokenness into brokenness only equals more brokenness. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you uh, for bringing us through this first lesson. Lord God, I just praise you. Uh, Lord, that, Lord, you, you, you just gave me, Lord, brought me far enough, Lord, in the last year or two, uh, Lord, developing my patience so I could sit here and teach this with some integrity. Lord, thank you. Lord, I wouldn't have even been able to teach this two years ago because I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Oh, thou man of God, your word says, judge us anew, another and do us the same thing. How shall you escape the damnation of God? Do I still struggle in areas? Lord, I just thank you. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for the hearers, Lord, and I just ask that each of us that are listening, Lord, each of them, Lord, they just dig into their lives and find out. In Jesus' name, amen, and so be it. Hey, just a quick break in this video to tell you to go to sermondownloads.net. The link is in the description section of this video. Download six different sermon packages or pass these on as a gift to Bible study teachers, preachers, pastors, deacons, whoever it is. We buy books. We buy devotionals, right? We buy all of this Christian literature, Sunday school lesson books. I'm asking you to take the next step and support sermondownloads.net. They're down in the description section of this video. Click on the link. So be it.